join me in welcoming Elaine May and Mike Nichols. I want you to think we were waiting for Elaine, we were waiting for mysterious workings of the organization, but she was here all the time. All the time. All the time. Now clearly we were all sitting here thinking the same thing, which was, how were you prescient? Where did your Orwellian vision come from? <laughs> because you invented the perfect metaphor for the behavior of the Bush administration in Iraq. <laughs> well, can you hear me? This is a good question because oddly enough, when I made this movie, Ronald Reagan was president. And there was Iran Contra, we were doing this in the middle, we were supporting Iran and Iraq. We put in Saddam, we take taken out the Shah, the Khomeini was there. And I remember looking at Ronald Reagan and thinking, I, this, I'm qualifying this, it was just an idea, I didn't really believe it. I thought, he's from Hollywood, he's a really nice man, it's possible that the only movies he's ever seen about the Middle East are the road movies with Hope and Crosby. <laughs> and I thought I would make that movie. <laughs> well, it's true, this is a road movie yes, it about was, the it, Middle East. It's, and uh, <laughs> it's, how many people here have never seen it before? Everybody. Uh, if all of the people who hate Ishtar had seen it, I would be a rich woman today. <laughs> well, that leads me sort of to the, the subtext of all this, which is it, we have to talk, I think, about studios and how we work with studios and what your experiences have been with studios. Um, a little bit of how you feel about, I, some of the people I think here have been seeing your movies over the weekend because they've been running them here at There's Walter Reed. There's only four of them, it's really well, quick to go through. You can do it in one weekend, <laughs> right? And I think many have. What is your feeling about A, the machine that has to be gotten together for a movie, and B, the relationship to the studio? Well, I'm doing, Every movie I made except for Heartbreak Kid, the studio changed regimes. In the middle of the movie? In the middle of the movie. How Which funny, that's just happening to me. It's, <laughs> no, it's happening to me, not one, but two studios. Oh my God. I'm working on two movies and two studios, the regime is changing as we speak. One is happening over this weekend. It, <laughs> it, it, it's not a great thing because whoever is coming in doesn't like you, A, because you've been chosen by someone else and they don't really know whether they want to take responsibility for it. So it's, it's not a good thing to have happen, but I've never made a movie except for Heartbreak Kid in which it didn't happen. I've only made three, but those three. Um, and this movie, the guy who took over Columbia was a guy named David Putnam. We remember. Yes, I do. I, I, I actually, I. I, I prepared for tonight, because I knew about it three weeks ago, and first the breast implants, and then I looked up the... the <laughs> <laughs> Worked very well, right? <laughs> and then I, I, I actually looked up this stuff, and when this guy, David Putnam, came in, he was a guy who, when Warren Beatty did Reds, I think he did Sherry at the Fire, and they were, they were up against each other, and he wrote of Warren, and it was published in the paper, that, that Warren should be spanked because he was profligate or whatever it was. But underneath the article, it didn't say in italics like it does after other letters, he is a competitor for the Academy Awards, he has an agenda. It just printed that article. And, and everybody adored him. In fact, people, my, today, uh, one of my dearest friends said he was really rotten to you, but he's a great guy. 
So people do seem to like him. You like him. I like. Well, let me say that I think that both in our work and in life, function determines character, and that I think that when you run a studio, you change. Um, I think that after David Putnam ran the studio, he turned out to be a very nice guy. But he talked a lot when he ran the studio. He did. <laughs> yes. And I, I think Ishtar is maybe the the uh, the prime example that I know of in Hollywood of studio suicide, <laughs> in that yes. it had a great preview. Tell me if I'm it wrong. It had three great previews. Three great previews. And then this really strange thing started to happen, which was articles from the studio about what a problem it was. Well, and the details, many of them not true, but details, and I, this is a really embarrassing thing to say, but it's just us, so I know it won't go any farther. <laughs> <laughs> when I, I left almost immediately for, I think, Bali, yeah. and it, it, it was political and it was a satire, but I, it was sort of my secret. And when these articles started coming out that had all these details, I thought, only for five minutes, I thought, it's the CIA. I, 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 I thought nobody, I didn't, I didn't dream that it would be the studio. And for one moment, it was sort of glorious to think that I was going to be, you know, taken down by the CIA, and then it turned out to be David Putnam. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, 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 I don't know I w that that's happened again or that it happens to that degree now. I, I think this man was uh, uh, sort of unique in that way, in that he was going to redo Hollywood and make it a better place. He was going to work from the inside. Um, it doesn't want to be a better place. That's like Las <laughs> Vegas, you know. And now there's the Wynn Hotel in Las Vegas now, which looks sort of like a real place. <laughs> and that's not really, but it's unnerving because you're in Las Vegas. There's supposed to be mirrors in the ceiling and round yes. beds. And what are you doing with Matisse reproductions? It's very, it <laughs> mixes you up. Yes, exactly. And I don't think that Hollywood, um, I think, look, from the very beginning, there's this been pro the problem between the executives and the people making the movies. Right. And it's a problem because movies are not something, the process of making movies is not something that can be apprehended from without. A guy that works in a studio is a very nice, very often intelligent executive who thinks that expressing an opinion in a meeting is a creative act. <laughs> <laughs> because that's all he gets to do. And that is as high in the creative scale as he can ever hope to get. <laughs> and the problem with it is that the opinions expressed very often have bear no relation to the work that's being done. No. Would you say you agree so far? Except for what? No, yes, yeah. I do agree. <laughs> I've convinced her. It, <laughs> here's what it's, where it gets to be a problem. They say, but it's our money. Now, here's the funny part. It's not, of course. It's GE's money. Or it's Sony's money. Who is us? It's funny that you say that because Charles Grodin, the FBI man in this movie, uh, who is a very funny man and a great actor, w defended this movie when it came out, and it was attacked because they kept saying, it's so much money, it's so much money, and it was actually not, but... Well, if you nowadays say what it cost, I mean, I'd love to make a movie for this. It was like $33 million, right? 30. 30. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and he said one day, as I recall, he said to, to the people who were saying it's so much money, they said, he said, what do you care? It's not like you're going to get the money. It's not like if the, if the movie were like 20 million, you'd get 10 of it. It's, you're never going to see it. What do you care how much money it is? And I thought, this is really true. They're well, not going to give it to school teachers. I mean, <laughs> well, and it, God forgive me, it's also interesting to look at their salaries. Yes. Their, their salaries <laughs> stay the same, no matter how the movies do. 
That's right, isn't it? Yeah. I've never thought of that. Sometimes <laughs> people get fired because their movies have done badly, but those people have gotten $12 million a year for the years that they chose movies unwisely. It's not a tragedy <laughs> when one of them goes to another <laughs> studio because I'm they keep changing off and going to different th studios. This is correct, isn't it? Yeah. It's so you really, A, you realize later in life that you've chosen the wrong job. <laughs> and B, it really does become, you think it's about making money, but I believe that it's really about keeping your job. And whether the movie makes money or not is really way down on the list. I agree. I also think that there's a, there's a whole probably larger subject, which is which are the movies that stay alive and why? And which are the movies that don't? It's very mysterious. I happen to see, I sometimes run Preston Sturge's movies, and there was one that my wife had never seen, so we looked at it this afternoon as preparation. And um, <laughs> the mystery of why the Lady Eve or Palm Beach story is completely alive now, and why Ishtar was hilarious and alive, and almost in some cases it seemed almost improvised tonight. Who knows what movies will live and what movies will die as time passes? Well, yours will live. Well, you're very kind. Yes, I am, <laughs> but, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we know. I don't think anybody knows. And the whole thing of a, of a movie catching the wind and, and sailing off because there's this wind circling the earth. You know, that there's a thing in, in, I guess you'd have to call it fashion, that is, is sort of like, the, they tell us that hurricanes come from, you know, a moth farting in South America, or an, an, <laughs> if enough of them do, if then it them fart, you builds as it goes <laughs> along. Th this is apparently how weather is created. <laughs> <laughs> But, and nobody understands the winds of fashion that, that strike movies, although I begin to have a theory. Yes, yes. It's the, it's the Hollywood foreign press. <laughs> well, here's my theory. The Golden Globes yes. exist, the people in the Golden Globes aren't exactly reporters. You know, they send something in once every two weeks to the Bulgarian Weekly. Yes. And they don't have all that much to do, and they are masters of fashion. So far, this sounds bright. And in, <laughs> in their deep understanding of what the coming fashion is, they will choose a movie, let's say, for instance, Brokeback, which is a wonderful movie. Yeah. But nevertheless, it's a nice movie to vote for because it makes you feel so very, very human. <laughs> and, and understanding of, yes. of all different kinds of people. Yes. <laughs> and yet, I mean, you could have a fugitive thought seeing that movie. You could think, boys, you could move to California. <laughs> <laughs> they have sheep, they have cows. You know, you would be fine in California. <laughs> there are many like you, they would understand you. <laughs> You could have friends. <laughs> so that I, th I think that we're all fashion ridden and because the Golden Globes are first and because they really have nothing to do but call the fashion, they tend to conf not confuse things but crystallize they them. Do crystal what about the wine scenes? Do you think that they influence the Golden Globes? Yes. Then what will the Golden Globes do now? <laughs> well, you think the wine scenes will stop influencing the oh, Golden Globes? Nothing matters to me except the fact that I've been trying to keep this chain in place all day long, and now it's gone. And now I'm just going to whip it off. Will anything be revealed? Just those implants. <laughs> <laughs> just there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, tell, now do, tell us a little bit about the yes. people you made the movies with. What do you think of the process of making movies? Do you miss it? Would you like to make more movies? And people like Anthea, our friend Anthea mm -hmm. Silbert, who was a great costume designer and an inspiriting and remarkable person, 
what is it like? How important is a person like that? And so forth. Um, a person like Anthony, well, there's about five of them. And when you meet them, they're sort of like friends, you want to keep them. But someone like Anthony on a movie is so good that I did on, on Heartbreak Kid, I said, I, I, I have no idea what these people would wear. And she said, white cotton underwear is what the girl would wear. That's what those blondes wear. And he would have a, uh, she was just perfect. She was just a, a true artist. And in a new leaf, she said, have you thought about your part? What's in your purse? And I hadn't thought about my part, I have no idea. And she was like a, a great artist. Um, and every once in a while you get an art, you have a, a, a fantastic art director and Silbert was wonderful. And so, and I do miss that, that those wonderful people who work with you on a movie and who you work with and who tell the story with you, uh, I, I miss that. But then I get to work with you on movies occasionally and that's fun. I agree. Uh, th that, that's the best part of, of making movies, I think. It's the only, it's the only thing that where you can work in a group where five or six people all can tell the same story in their own specific, specific voice. They each, they have a voice. The, the music person has a voice. The, the makeup person makes you up to tell the story. The, and they, you all tell the same story. That's in the end what you are trying to do, have the same story. And I miss that because you can't really do it on the stage. The no, yeah. you're exactly right. I had never thought of it that way, but there is a way, there's a moment in which you're all Many, many people, really, when you think of the best boy and you think of the lighting mm -hmm. and, you th and so on and so on, many people are putting in something that no one else con could contribute. And if you're the leader, if you're lucky, you found an idea that you can communicate to them. Because people love an idea. And it, can be, it should be a very simple idea. But whatever the idea is, it should be something that everybody can say, yes, Oh, I see what you mean. I get it. Well, in that case... Yes, that's right. If you say a cul-de-sac, you want a cul-de-sac with a long escape? I got it. <laughs> I know exactly what to build. Yeah. I know exactly how to light that, and so forth. And that's the joy of it, of course, is that you can inflame some remarkable people. I have a story about Anthea that I guess you know. I may not. I, I, ended, I stopped making a movie once on the fifth day. This is a great story. I do and, know, but... And what happened was that I... We got five days into it, and I hadn't really prepared. I hadn't really been paying enough attention, and the, the script needed work, and so on. And I said, could I see all the dailies of everything we've done so far? And I was with the editor, and I was with the producer, and I was with everybody, and we looked at the dailies, and I said, this is shit. This is no good. And everybody said, no, don't be silly. And the editor said, I'll put it together. And composer said, we got to do music, and, and I said, well, let me think about it. I went into my office, and Anthea came in, and she said, you're right. It is shit. And I said, I thought so. <laughs> w what should I do? She said, stop. I said, stop in the middle of making a movie? How can I do that? It's already cost $3 million. And she said, well, what, is it better to spend $6 million? If it's no good, it's no good. And I went to the head of the studio, who luckily was my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, an exception to what we were saying earlier. And uh, he said, well, it's terrible, but I mean, if, if you really think it's no good, we'll stop. And we actually did stop, and, and years later, that script was, had been worked on. It was made into a very successful movie. And it, it should be possible to do strange things because um, movies, like any art form, are strange. They're, they're strange all on their own, and you should be able to do odd things to fit in with them. But once time is gone, and time is now going, because everything is so expensive, yes, people don't have time to figure out, well, maybe this scene has to be redone. Maybe this is a bad place for us to go. Maybe, God forbid, we've got the wrong actor here. These things, nothing can be reconsidered. It's, it seems to me that the, 
the thing that costs the most money that you can't not spend money on in a movie is publicizing it. Because even if you make a movie for $10, it's 50 million to get somebody to come in to see it. And I always thought that what everybody should, all artists should do who are pissed about this, and I know very little about business, so this is probably a really bad idea. But what I thought they should do is that they should get together and buy a theater, one theater in key towns. And just, if they have a movie that they really think is good, that they really think, you know, they don't have art houses anymore. But not, not an art house so much, just a movie that nobody's gonna spend 60 million to publicize. Because actually now when you make a movie, they, they come to you from the publicity department and they say, we, we just don't know how to publicize this. We, we don't know what to say about it. And sometimes the movie gets turned down because of that, as you know. But I, I always thought that that would be the best thing to do, to, to suddenly to just have one theater. You'd always have people coming. You, movies don't cost that much anymore. There's digital movies. Well, that's the, th I mean, there are wonderful things happening. There are young people like Steven Soderbergh who made a movie, I think, for $15,000 in Ohio mm -hmm. with real people, and he released it simultaneously in theaters on DVD, yes. pay-per-view, and some fourth way that's been invented that I haven't <laughs> heard about yet. <laughs> and they, it, you, you have to break it up. And he also operates his own movies. I mean, I give up, you know. I <laughs> can't do that. I can't do a movie for $15,000 and also operate. So oh, you could if you wanted to, but but you thirty. <laughs> I need thirty, thirty-five. <laughs> but the the fact that a we got to remember how young they are, the movies. B mm -hmm. that there are remarkable people coming now. But he's not that young, Soderbergh. He's made many movies, and he's he was young, but, but he's not anymore. <laughs> well, he's young enough. He's younger than we are, but yeah. he's really not that young. <laughs> Well, he's, I th he's 40 if he's a day. Well, that's not, forgive me, young. Um, <laughs> but, but yes, it's a, it's a terrific thing that he does. But, but really, most of the time, people, because he's, he's done it after he's have done the, all, all those other movies with Clooney and, and Brad Pitt, and, you know, he's made had a lot of very successful movies. So it's almost whimsical to do this. When people are starting out and they have some movie and they really want it to be seen, they aren't that clever. They can't say, I can, you know, you can look at a DVD, I can push it into your mind, I can shove it up your ass, or whatever, however you look at movies now, they really want it to be in the theater. And I, 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 really, believe, I, I really don't know why that hasn't happened. I really don't know why there aren't theaters that aren't, they're not that expensive to run. You think I'm wrong? No, you I disagree. don't think you're wrong. I think that there's a dozen ways to see a movie now, including on your own computer or in the back seat of your car. There's all sorts but of places. But it's not as good as a theater. It's not as good as a theater, but it's another way. And there's, and there's something very nice about everything disintegrating, and this is certainly a time when you might say that. Yes. <laughs> which is that, that more, there, just for these last 10 minutes, more things are possible. As you know, we're thinking about doing a movie for, if not $15,000, for half a million dollars. Yes, it's so and, close. <laughs> and it's the one I look yeah. forward to most. Yes. Because I already know a lot of things I want to do, and some of them is improvising, and some of them is shooting 20 pages in one day, or half the movie in one day, or whatever you do. Right. And we also know that when you have a small group of people that you really trust and that you understand and they understand you and you know what you're doing together, you can do remarkable things and you don't need the 125 people that come with the big trucks when a movie converges on a building in New York. We see them on every corner. And I I'm know, always it's amazing. bitching and moaning saying, damn, movie <laughs> people, and I walk three feet further and they're my own people. They're working on <laughs> somebody else's movie. Hey, Mike, how are you, mate? Darling, I didn't know you were working here. And sometimes on my own block. <laughs> but we don't necessarily need the big machine every time. No. But but it's but it becomes very difficult to I mean y y you you also are somebody who whatever movie you make you're going to find a way for it to be seen and shown and cuz you're very you know, famous and very good. 
but people who are uh, beginning or people who are who, who don't have the clout that that you have, um, they they have no place to show their movie. I mean, they I. Uh, my friend has a distribution company. He's here somewhere. He's responsible for, there he is. And he has, m these people make movies and they, he buys them for like, I shouldn't tell this, like 10 bucks. I mean, they've, they've raised the money, they've killed them, so they, and there's no way to distribute them. There's no where to play them. There's no where to see them. And those, are, and, and probably only one out of 30 of them is that good, but of 30 is pretty not bad. I mean, th I mean, there's there's stuff you do. All of us do movies or not that we really feel hopeless about. I once went on a. I was part of a cruise, and I I said I would lecture one day, and everyone in the audience had, had written a screenplay or wanted to write a screenplay. They all sent them to me. I know. <laughs> and I said. Give me write a three-page summary of this and give it to me, and I'll read it. And people said, "Are you crazy? Are you insane? Are you nuts?" You, not one came in, not one, because no one wanted to take the time on that cruise to type up three pages of their screenplay. So not a lot of people will do this, but there are some people who have a a, a kind of a real dream and a real goal, and it's so overwhelming to think of after you finish it, and then what do you do, and then where do you go? It's such a big world now. It's so hard to do anything. It's, it's so hard to get anyone on the phone. It's so hard to return a piece of furniture. It's almost <laughs> impossible. Yes, it is. So there has to be some, you really do think there's got to be some way where you can have some kind of control where everything is not such a terrible, terrible problem. And look how quickly we all get used to eating shit. I mean, really, about seven years ago, if somebody had answered the phone saying, we really, we value your call, please hold on for the next hour and 25 minutes, <laughs> we would have hung up, we would have been out. We get used to it just like that. We get used to it very fast. We get used to, to skim milk very fast. Whole milk tastes like cream now. We adapt very quickly to being treated very badly. So. We all agree. Well then, good, I'm glad I've said it. <laughs> I do think that, that if the, that you put your finger on what is, is, I don't know what holy is, but, but central about making movies, what makes it something that you never want to, that I never want to stop, and just as seeing them, you never want to stop seeing them, is that, that there is something that happens among people. And what it finally is, forgive me, is, is a sort of, melding of unconsciouses that when you do your best you're you're depending to a large extent on your unconscious when you've done this for some length of time because you're waiting for the thing you can't think of you're waiting for the surprise shooting that day and when a large group of people is waiting for what will today's surprise be and they're all sort of in the same place and and you have the people that you do it with every time that and you love them and they love you and you know more and more about each other. And something begins to happen. I happened to see over the weekend, I went to see Oprah Winfrey do a, a, a sort of thing she does in the theater, telling people how to be your best, live your best life. And she charges a lot for it, and the money goes to the charity of the town in which she's done it. And she has this gift. She can hear 2,500 people sitting in the dark. She can connect with what they're thinking. Yes, she's amazing. And in hearing them, remarkable things happen. And she says remarkable things and funny things and so forth. But in a weird way, we need all the, all the unconsciouses and, and the, the souls of the people that are making the movie to make some kind of connection with the unconsciouses of what Gloria Swanson called those wonderful people out there in the dark. <laughs> what we are those wonderful people out there in the dark. And the, that connection still lives even as, you know, everything says to us, your call is important to us, which is a lie. I mean, everything is a lie. Everything is. But, but the unspoken things are not all lies yet. But don't you feel 
and, and you too, don't we all feel that, that we actually now feel we can choose what to believe? I mean, if I see a really great commercial, I, I know this car isn't going to change my life or whatever it is, and still, I, I know it's a lie, but I really think about buying it. And when this girl, was it Jessica Lynch, is that the, the, the young girl who was in the Iraq war? That was her yes. name. Jessica Lynch, there's a story about her that she was a hero and they abused her in the hospital. And, they, and she finally, this girl said, it's not true. That's, that's not what happened. Well, she told the truth at every point. She told the truth at every point, and yeah. she went on Diane's show, and she told the truth on that show, and they made a, a movie of it, a television movie, and the television movie totally ignored what she said, <laughs> and they made it about what was in the papers. And somebody said to me, I said, well, this is just bullshit, isn't it? I mean, she, they said, well, it's, it's such a much better story. <laughs> and that was very scary. Well, it's so weird what you said. A... Yes, and B, I have, th I have that with cars, but I have it another way. I, <laughs> I, had a Merced I had Mercedes for a long time, then I had a Mercedes, and it was always in the shop, and they didn't, no longer understood how to fix it, <laughs> literally. <laughs> you know, it was so complicated, they didn't know what to do, so they would <laughs> put it out in the back where the cars gathered dirt while they worked on other cars. And then after about, like, two, three weeks, they would say, come and get it, and it would be just as busted. <laughs> And then I switched to a BMW because it was rented. Everything is rented. And I, the same thing happened with the BMW. So, so then I got a nice Lexus and everything is fine. And, and, but when I see the gorgeous commercials for the beautiful new Mercedes and the beautiful new BMWs, I sort of think it's like a, a hooker with clap, you know, that <laughs> I, yeah. I, I know too much. <laughs> You know, they can't get me with the pictures anymore because I know they don't work and there's nobody to fix them. Yes, but still this hooker with clap image, this beautiful <laughs> yeah, hooker. Thank with you, clap thank image. you. I'm a poet, basically. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> I'll always remember it now. <laughs> Should we quickly take a few questions from the audience? Yeah, yes. I, I want everyone. Thank you. Uh, when you uh, made Heartbreak Kid and The Graduate and Carnal Knowledge, uh, we had a society that was um, unfolding, and you helped to disinhibit it and put it on the right track. And somehow it hasn't maintained itself. So the, the, I'm projecting for you, there must have been a joy in discovering themes that you were going to be working on. What has happened now? Where do your themes come from? Is there a joy? Is there a content that you're preoccupied with to tell? This is a, um, I only made one of the pictures you named, but this is a very good, uh, it's, it's a very good question. I, I, I want to answer it with a, this, this odd thing. When psychoanalysis began, Freud, used to take very repressed people and try to break them down, their structure down, so that it would all come out. It has now changed so that what psychoanalysts try to do is to take very broken apart people and repress them and put them together, really, and structure them. Because people just come in and they're, they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> and and it, it is a little like that with movies. You think, how can I shock? What can I say? What truth can I tell that's as good as this lie they believe? Because the thing about what I choose to believe, the fact that we feel, maybe it's this administration or, or the world or, or television, but the fact that we kind of feel that we can choose the truth, that really, a friend of mine called today and said, I, I read a story that when you made Ishtar, you got to the desert and you said, what are those hills? And they said, dunes, and you said, flatten them. And I said to him, well, do you believe that? And there was a long pause, and he said, well, no, but it's such a great story. <laughs> and it's sort of, a, it's like that it makes it hard to do a movie, because you think, what can I possibly choose? When, when people can so irresponsibly say anything, when there's this show where, where people will do anything, where actually there is nothing there's no, there's no, nobody's ashamed of anything. You're just lucky to get it on television. 
your whatever this repression is, it is hard to find a theme. It's really hard to find something and to say it in a way that will get people's attention. So I I have no idea. Do you? I I'm afraid I'm still so in love with the for want of a better word, process. And with the the thing I love most about movies and that I love most about other people's work is is small things. That if you think about your favorite thing in a movie or in a play or in a performance ever, it's always something very small that you can barely tell other people about. It's so small. But it just makes you gasp because it's like a little pebble of truth. It's something true. And harvesting them, because after all, I mean, the, the acting is done by other people. Harvesting them is still something that I think is so thrilling that with luck, and you just, if you, I think the thing is to keep doing it. I'd love to get you to keep doing it, because <laughs> with luck, you can, you can get, catch that wind. It can still be done. Yes, but I think you, really the question is those tiny moments which are the which are the thing, which are the best, which are, which are, they are what you remember. What do you choose to put them in? What what book do you pick? What the, what what do you choose to make this process about? Because you can make this process, I think about almost anything, any small thing you can take and make a million little truths out of that stun you. No question and. For me, because I teach once a week, big deal, but I, I had to sort of try to think of a couple of ideas for teaching, and I, one of them is, one of the few ideas is that, that in working on something and also in the thing itself, if it's a movie, the question really is always, what is this really like? Not what is the convention, not what do people always do in this case, not what happens in a ribald comedy or a tragedy comedy or a, a film of surgic unhappiness, you know, whatever. What is it, what is this really like? And in the search for what it's really like, something that you do instinctively, that every time you write, it is answers the question, what is this really like? Every line reminds you of a living person and the funny things we do and the silly things we do and sometimes the nice things we do. That the answer to the question, what is this really like, it can be expanded a little bit to where are we really at now? Where is it? Where are? What is this like? What is the hell is happening? That that's a very good. That's, but that's your question. Yeah, that's a very good question. the moratorium and um, uh, people were going to Washington DC but I was committed to work that I was doing and I choreographed a moratorium and I took you know different pieces of music and a collage and and put it together and there was an urgency to participate in my society and to uh, do this choreographic work with it and so things like that are the little things but they were part of a big picture so the little things, are they part of a big picture? Or are you, you know, holding on to the little things for their preciousness? Check. Mike? <laughs> um. I, I don't know. You know, I, the, the thing about little things is interesting because there's a little thing that I heard that's, that's the most horrifying thing I believe I've ever heard. And it's what you said, that what is it really like? How, how different life is from, from the movies. They were, is this a book that you gave me? This woman who worked in a Nazi concentration camp who was up for trial and they said, how could, you, how could you do this? How could you, knowing that these people were being sent to the gas chambers, how could you participate in this with, with these beds? How could you do it? And she said, 
you don't understand. We had such a limited amount of beds. They were filled so quickly, she said. We, we had to keep them moving. And she said that with absolute sincerity, she had narrowed her vision down. She was not evil. I mean, she was evil, but she wasn't evil the way we, we really think of evil. She, she just had a small German accent. She just felt... <laughs> She had just narrowed her vision down to, to this, to filling the beds. And somebody was, I think it was, I think it was Warren was telling me that, that when you have a lack of imagination and you do harm, this is, I think it's T.S. Eliot, that you do the harm, you, you, you don't do it to be mean, you do it to get your job done, and you are totally unaware and unaffected by the harm you do. You don't have the imagination to, 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 to participate in it. And I always thought, how would you, I, I can't build a whole movie to do that moment in a moment that would repel everyone in the audience. But when you speak about having moments that, that are really like life, what, what is it really like when you lose someone? What is it really like when you're happy? What is it really like? There are very few moments like that in movies. They're all pretend. When you see a real moment in a movie, it's almost shocking. You almost, it, it, isn't it? It's almost a... It is shocking, and as we know, it still happens. And we all revere it, and we see movie after movie, hoping for it, sometimes finding it. Movies from here, movies from there. It, it still happens. It still happens in, in plays. You have to wait a long time. <laughs> and, and there's almost nobody you can trust. I mean, people are forever sending me to plays, and I say, son of a bitch, they've done it again. Somebody I could, thought I could trust has sent me to this piece of shit. <laughs> and I, I get really angry. And forget the papers and the, that. I mean, I'm not talking about reviews, but it's harder and harder to find somebody who sees theater the way you do. I don't know, we're flying apart like the universe in some way. But now and then, by hook or by crook, you see something on a stage that's also alive and remarkable. It still happens. And the whole question, here we are in the place we are in, that we all know, that your picture predicted. Surely, we have to find hope. And we have to have behavior in our hope. We have to wake up and start to do stuff and be citizens and speak up. Well, let me ask you something. I speak for the whole audience now. Stop me if I'm wrong. What do we do? You're asking me? <laughs> it's like that yeah. interview, like I, I told you about the interview with Cher that I heard. No the, it was so wonderful. She, somebody, the, the interviewer said, hey, Cher, what, what do you think about this Middle East, the whole thing that's happening? And she said, listen, I'm Cher. <laughs> Please, she said, ask me about showbiz. <laughs> you know, it, it, I love her. She always tells the truth, and she's and she, of course, she, and I'm shared too. <laughs> but Cher has never said we have to have hope. Well, as we, you just, we did. have to look for hope. Of course, we have to. You're look for hope. You're not really Cher. <laughs> and we have. To, well, I mean, a very simple thing that we all know about. The congressional elections are coming. Let's get off our ass. Let's get something done. Let's make everybody get off their ass. Let's do something. And please, not just by email. I, d I don't want to get yeah. any more emails from groups, you know. Yes. I, w I want individuals to talk to each other and say, who are you voting for? And is this an okay Democrat? And who do we d work on? And what do we do? That's the next thing we get to do. Has anybody got a better idea? Please tell us now. There are mics. There's one up there. Yes. Hi, it may not be a better idea. I'm, I'm just uh, responding or to some of the comments you made, Mike, about uh, um, theater that seems to be flying away from you, and Elaine, about, uh, about the fact that we seem to choose the facts or the truth we believe in. To me, it all seems to correlate to a dumbing down of our society that just seems to be more of an interest in just sheer comedy, less in drama, less in something that's important. People don't care, they don't have the time or the intelligence to care. And I'm wondering, A, if you agree, and B, if that's the case, how is it when you're a creative person trying to work in a world 
where, in fact, the audience doesn't really care to be elevated anymore. They want to be sort of dumbed down. Well, you have to remember that, that the, the movies, most movies are made for like 16-year-old boys. Uh, maybe that's changing. And 16-year-old boys have had truly a very poor education. Really, it is, it, it, the, the point is that people want to make, I think, too much money. And I, this, it, if you're going to make a movie that's going to make $100 million, you're going to have to get all those 16-year-old boys and, and their dates. So really what you have to start saying, it's back to my theater idea, really what you have to start saying is how do you think smaller? Well, people are thinking smaller. That's the good news about this year. Capote. What could be smaller than Capote? And the, the, <laughs> no, I'm talking about money, money spent. You know, it, it's, a, it's a modest movie it that is. Reached, is reaching a lot of people. True. Squid and the Whale, Brokeback Mountain. I mean, these are small movies they are. that are, uh, to begin with, would seem to be aiming for a small audience. And this is all very good. It is good, you're right. I mean, Weinsteins are Weinsteins, as we all know, but they also are the ones that started yes. pushing very small movies for awards, so that the small movies would make a medium amount of money. All, everything is still possible. The fact that everyone does seem hypnotized in some way. Yes, well. Is unnerving, and I have a theory, boring theory that has to do with everybody's on their iPods and their Blackberries and their trios and their back seats of the car, TV screens, and we are behaving like, like a person who is avoiding the truth, is avoiding something. We're behaving like, what's the name for, there's a whole name for a person. Hypnosis. No, well, uh, oh. we're, we're behaving certainly like hypnotized people. Yes. We're somnolent in some way, and and we can. One, I think, I hope we can wake each other up, but please, one at a time. And there's so many things. That inv <laughs> I mean, your call is important to us. How the hell do you know who's calling? That that it's the goddamn generalities that are, that make for those. Think tapes on phones and those annoying emails from a group and so on. The individual, there's not enough money in the individual. <laughs> and we have to, I don't know, let's person to person fight for a little bit. Well, the, let me ask you something. To, let's say, to simply actually stop th this, I'm just taking this, your call is important, do you think? As, as an example, because having visited so, a large corporation, these exe some executive is getting a hundred million a year and saving money by not having an op, some, giving some woman a job for thirty thousand a year. You know, and he says, "I don't want to take it from the shareholders' money." And you say, "Well, you pay it. You know, <laughs> deduct it." And but there's no way to enforce that. We all know that that's true. We all know that that's bad, and we all know that th there's something about the tiny things in life happening to you that devalues you, that, that, that lessens you, that dumbs you, that makes you number. You, you have to get number and number not to be offended. So pretty soon you get pretty thick. And it seems to me that, that, that really, because I'm a much more negative person than you are and always have been, you, you the lightness, I the dark. Good bragging. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it seems to me that at some point, what you really want to say is, for one day, I will not deal with a company that doesn't have a real operator. I'll just gather every, for one day, I'll, I'll make them lose that much money. For one day, I won't go to a bookstore where the guy there says, I don't know. Uh, for one day, <laughs> just for one day, I will cost, I, I won't just say it's so hard, I just have to get home to the rerun of Cheers, I can't bother with it. For one day, you'll take the trouble to make trouble for, for somebody else because it's the only thing that keeps you from sort of getting thick, from sort of retreating, from sort of saying, you know, I, I think that's what dumbing down kind of is. It's just too much trouble. And there is such a thing as too much trouble. It's hard to, it's hard to find a line because if you're a <laughs> snob like me, if somebody says, what is it in regards to? I say, well, it's in regards to Broadway. If, 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 if you want to know what it's in regard to, I tell your boss I want to borrow a lot of money, you know. I mean, 
that where do you start, where do you stop, when are you but the I pain in the ass? that's a very good way to start. I really do. No. I mean, you've got to start tiny, as Giuliani said. <laughs> it, don't go after the big guys. Get the pushers off the streets. I mean, really, uh, you, I mean, I know he did a lot of bad things, but he really, I remember when you couldn't walk around New York after 5 o'clock, and now you can. So with all of that, you really do start, I think, with tiny crimes. Because I think can, they're like crimes. I think can, there are little insults that you get all the time. You can with. become a pain in the ass. So. I mean, uh, I, I can't stand people. Somebody actually working for me actually said, he's coming to talk to I and she. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and God help me, I said, you know, I don't think you can work here. I, don't, <laughs> I, I can't live like this. I, I need the accusative case. I need the dative case. Why, they must be remembered, too. Their cases, for Christ's sake. Why are they never used? But I'm a pain in the ass. You can't live like that. You have, we have to give up grammar and stuff, I think. Well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, yes, you're a pain in the ass, but amusing. <laughs> <laughs> Who has a question? Yes. Um, Earlier today, early this afternoon, I had the good fortune of seeing Mikey and Nikki for the first time. And it's, <laughs> it's every bit as, as breathtaking and as astounding as I'd heard it was. And it occurred to me, talk, uh, talking with my wife and friends afterwards, it is such a piece that seems so at home in that period of the 1970s where independent filmmaking seemed to come out of a studio system of the period of, of Altman and Scorsese and, and your film, Mr. Nichols' uh, Carnal Knowledge. Having said that, what happened? The stories about it are, uh, the mishaps are, as leg are almost as legend as Ishtar in terms, I mean, as, as recently as the Terence Rafferty piece in the New York Times about this, this weekend of, of exposing as much film as was exposed for Gone with the Wind and hiding the, the negative from the Flattening studios. those dunes in the desert. Yes, exactly. I, I'd love to know how much of that is, is hyperbole and how much uh, of that what happened, and why ultimately did it get such short shrift in terms of release? Well, the studio, uh, really this is true, the studio changed heads. I mean, the, the guy who was in charge, Frank Ilbrons, left, and a new guy came in, Barry Diller came in, in the middle, and he thought it was a comedy. <laughs> and uh, we screened it, and, he, and, it, and it wasn't. And uh, they stopped it. They p pulled it, and we were like two thirds done, and it, and we just well, I don't even know how we finished. I think it, it, we had still men shooting, and I once told John Cassavetes that he would have to actually shoot his own death scene. I said, you you shoot the coverage because he was so wonderful with the camera. We had no one. It was really a very difficult thing to do because it wasn't what the 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 two people who were in the the two the the studio heads that were involved did not like each other. And they were really not happy with this movie because it was not a comedy. It was actually the first time it was previewed. The guy who previewed it, who was the vice president in charge of, what were you vice president in charge of, Union? Something at Paramount. Yeah. He, he, I said, please don't put my name on it because people will think it's a comedy. And they'll hate it in the end. And he tried not to, but they did, they said it was a preview, and they laughed all the way through it, laughed. And in the end, when the guy got shot, there was the most stunned silence, and then boos, loud boos. Somebody said, are they cheering? I said, no, they're booing. <laughs> and what happened was, is that it was, it was, it, it, I think probably what happened is, is that it was, I, I, I should have just said, hey, this is a sad, dark movie that no one will enjoy and you want to do it. But no, we, uh, we got names and it seemed to have a few jokes and the guy who, and there was a lot of politics involved and it could just be me because I've had trouble with almost every movie I've done. I had trouble with The New Leaf, they took a murder out of it because I wanted to do the first comedy in which someone got away with murder. I had trouble with Mikey and Nikki. I, I didn't have trouble with Heartbreak Kid because I was hired for it. But with every movie that I've done, I, I may just be a pain in the ass. No, I, I've thought about this a lot. I, I think that, uh, if you'll recall, the, the very first 
person who was a line producer for you, who was a, line for, for a friend of both of ours, there was the famous story of what happened when, he, when you did Process for the first time, Blue Screen, I believe it was, yeah. and this person who you hired, and he was a professional, got you a blue car. And blue screen means that everything that's blue disappears, and what remains is what is not blue. So they shot all these scenes in a blue car, and the people were sort of sitting in the air. Well, it, it wasn't even that. We just couldn't shoot, which cost an enormous am amount of money. But, but the point is, is because the studio was, it wasn't in back of it. I mean, the studio was not in back of it. It, was, it just had one you know, screw up after another. And it, you know, when I started, when the first movie I directed, I really didn't want to direct A New Leaf. But they wouldn't give me director approval. And the guy who represented me, Hilly Elkins, said, they won't give you director approval, but you can direct it. <laughs> and I said, I know nothing. I, I actually remember calling you and I said, well, how should I say action, firmly or <laughs> begging? <laughs> and I, 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 so I began, uh, I began sort of on one foot and just continued that way. I, I, I think, think the real secret of movies is putting a, a crew together and it takes about 25 years I, I think you're to get it right. Yes. And that's not an exaggeration. And you have to do it steadily because you can't ask anyone. Everybody will say about everyone you ask, they say it's a very good man. Nobody will ever tell you you have to find out. And when you have that many people that you can depend on, everything changes. It just does. Some of them are here tonight. We're, we're family and, and we can depend on each other, but it took forever. It takes, a, yeah, it really is. It's like friendship. It's who, who's left after the others that's, that's burn exactly off. That's exactly right. right. And, and, and uh, um, Actually, you start you you started with some you started with Anthea. That's right. And 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 gave her to me. So she, and she lasted. It, it, it takes and it takes a whole bunch of Antheas, and yes. then they save you even when you screw up. Let's take one more question. Oh, um. Oh, start again? Oh, okay. I think that... Uh, uh, you said New Leaf was a great movie. I heard that. It was a great movie, right. <laughs> <laughs> and that your, uh, your um, uh, performance was Chaplin-esque. And um, I have this fantasy of winning the Mega Millions, and I would give you the money to add those scenes that you, you, want, you wanted to make it longer, didn't you? I, I had a murder in it. Yeah. But you shot it, right? It exists. I shot the murder. It existed. It was a wonderful scene. Let's get them to put it back. Well, if they win the Mega Millions, <laughs> it's yours. I mean, I could... Uh, but could you talk a little bit about uh, making a, a New Leaf? It's a, it's, it's a very underappreciated movie. Well, Please. okay. Um, I, I started out by having a... Uh, it was a short story. Being an Alfred Hitchcock omnibus... And I, I liked it because I realized that the guy, the hero, was going to kill this woman. And he actually killed somebody else. I thought, oh, he's going to kill her, and he doesn't realize that he likes her. I mean, I reading this short story, and I thought, what an interesting thing to do as a, as a movie. So I, I wrote it, and we went through this thing where they said, you, you know, I said, I have to have director approval. And they said, you know, you can direct it. So I... I, I couldn't get it on without Walter Matthau, who started out as a regular person, and then, um, and then on the day we began, and, and then they wanted to have Carol Channing play the woman. And I said, I, it has to be somebody who really disappears. It's the guys moving and blah, blah, blah. So they said, well, can I pick the person? And they said, no, but you can play it. Um, and all for, all for the same money. So, and the first day of, uh, when, we, when we began it, um, it was, it was a very tough movie for me. I knew absolutely nothing about movies, nothing. I barely knew what a camera looked like. I, I, and I, I really, I struggled through, this is it, this story is almost unbelievable. 
I had written screenplays and I could write great looking scenes, but I didn't know there was such a thing as coverage. If you know, do, does everybody know what, I'm, surely now everybody's got a camera. I didn't know that you had to shoot two people that you, in order to cut. We I call it a master. You shoot a master first is what you're saying. No, no, I actually didn't know you had to shoot anything but one thing. Th that's the master. Uh, even if you shot one person, I mean, I thought oh, you I could shoot. I, I just you thought thought you, you just shot one thing per scene. Yes, one thing per scene is what I thought. I thought you picture the scene, and it's, if it's just one person, you do that. And I, I, nobody told me, because they didn't want me on the movie, and they wanted me fired, and I was way ahead of schedule. The first week, I had jumped four weeks ahead of schedule. I had no coverage. <laughs> And they want, and I was very proud. And they wanted me to go in and cut it. And I said, "Well, this is too long. Let's take some time out." And the editor said, "Well, we can't. This is how little I knew. I mean, kids with cameras know more than." That. I said, "We can't." And I learned that weekend that you had to cover. So I went back and immediately fell behind like six months. I mean, I. <laughs> And on this movie, I, the only thing I knew anything about was I knew about acting. I knew I had my cast in, in, in the movie. I had my actors. I'd been an acting teacher. I directed. But, and, I, and I knew how I wanted it to look. And I would say things like, I, I, <laughs> I want them to be full figure but not tiny. Because everybody said, you don't have to know about lenses, they said, little girl. You don't have to know about... And, and, I, and finally, somebody took me aside and said, there are long lenses and wide lenses. There are so through the entire movie, I, I've never, you've never seen a movie with that many mistakes. And it was really, uh, they, I, my editor was a really nice man who had a drug problem. <laughs> <laughs> and the first cut he did, if you really want to know, the first cut he did, he did flash forwards. So that I would watch the scene, and then there would be a piece of the next scene in it. He'd never edited it. It was his first movie. <laughs> and I said, there's a piece of the next scene in this. <laughs> and he said, it's a flash forward. <laughs> and there was nothing I could, I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. I, I fortunately, he, he owed, take, he didn't know D, but he took too many drugs and left. And the apprentices and I sort of took out the flash forwards and put it together. But I did, because the story was so good, and because the actors, the cast that I had were, were my, what you're saying, they were my people. And because I had Anthea Filbert and some, and I was smart enough, I, the crew was not very good, but I hired Dee Dee Ryan. I, had, I took some people who, I said, you know, teach me about Rich. And I managed to learn on that movie while shooting it. I made so many mistakes that I actually learned a little bit about how to do a movie. I didn't learn. I had such a good focus puller on that movie that I didn't know there was such a thing as focus till the next movie. I mean, I, I, because the, it, the, there's no way to know unless you, somebody teaches you or you screw up. And when you start a movie by somebody saying, well, you, you can't, you know, pick a director, but you can direct it, you really start knowing nothing. And that, that was the story of that movie was really every day just became about trying to remember what it was about and not screwing up too badly. Because if anybody can screw up badly, I, I'd like to, I, I, I give you this blouse as an example. I just lost the chain of it totally. I, 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 it was just a really uh, hair-raising experience. But, but, I had a, but I had such a strong story that I really, it was hard to screw it up. And what you're saying is right. If you have some story that you want to tell, it's almost hard to make it not work, even me. Let me tell you a quick story about why I think New Leaf is so great. Is I was supposed to do American Beauty for DreamWorks. And uh, one day I'm getting ready. I'm with my family, we're going to fly to an island. And there's a storm. And my little cell phone rings, and it's Steven Spielberg, and he says, where are you? And I said, well, it's funny, because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm on a plane waiting for a storm to clear up. We're about to take off. And he said, what kind of plane? And I said, well, uh, it's a Citation Ultra. And he said, well, your plane is too small. <laughs> and 
I said, thank you. Um, <laughs> and you called because? And he said, uh, well, are you going to do American Beauty or not? Because if you're not, we have Sam Mendes. And really? I, thought, I think he's trying to tell me something. So I said, Sam Mendes is great. You should do it. You should do it with Sam. You know, I, I have to wait till this other picture I'm going to make, and you go ahead and take Sam. So they did, and then I saw the movie, and it was great. And I said to my wife, do you think I should have done it? She said, no. The reason it's great is Sam's excitement about making his first movie. And she was right. And she was right about you and A New Leaf, because with all that... You were still so excited about making your first movie, and, and we see it. It's, it's, it's alive. Yes, it, it's, it, I think really probably that is what experience does. It, it just says, uh, it just teaches you what you shouldn't do. But in the beginning, you think you can do anything because you have no experience, and that really does give you a lot of energy. Do you remember what you said to me about The Exorcist? I also turned down The Exorcist because I didn't want to do that to a little girl for six months. And it was my best friend again, was the head of the produce of the studio, and, and it opened and it was a gigantic hit, and he took me to see the line, and he said, you personally lost $30 million by not making this movie. And I said to Elaine, I'm trying to feel bad, because John says I lost $30 million by not doing The Exorcist, and Elaine said, don't worry, darling, if you'd made it, it wouldn't have made that kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> It, 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 it wouldn't have. You would have made it human. <laughs> you People were right. It's been real. <laughs> I would like to, one last question, and then I have a lesson. There's a lady here. They'll never get to you, so you have to yell. I can pass you this mic. No, okay. <laughs> Oh, but one of the this one of the I don't know how many women I'm making film, but, um, four, five, six. There were relatively few, and do I feel that part of the difficulty was being a, a woman? You know, th that's a really good question. A part of the difficulty in with the new leaf was that everybody that I mean Walter would. Matt, Matt, who I came to love, incidentally, would call me Mrs. Hitler and this, that, and the other thing. And I wanted to be, I wanted not to frighten anyone. And so people would leave me saying, she's a nice girl. What is this big thing about it? She's a nice girl. And of course, I wasn't a nice girl. And when they found it out, they hated me all the more. And I think that's what really happens with this. Not that they're women. It's that as women, they think, well, I want to show that I, I'm a nice person. I'm I'm no one to be feared. I'm I'm not I'm not one of those women who are not nice women. And in the end, when when it comes down to it, you're just as rotten as any guy. You'll fight just as hard and just as you know you're going to get your way. So I think the real trick is for women and, and where they get caught is they should they they should start out tough. They don't start out tough. They, they start out saying, don't be afraid of me. I'm, I'm only a woman. And they're not only women. They're just as tough as guys. In that way, I think I did have trouble, because, but only because I seemed so pleasant. <laughs> I, I think we should close. But...